everyone. Welcome to another episode of ADHD Love Parent Talk, where we talk about all things ADHD. Today, I have a very special guest, Andy, who is, he's my, I'll say like my cohort. Uh, we both work at the ADHD or volunteer for the ADHD Lifestyle Magazine. So I'm very excited to have him on our episode today. He is a coach and he's going to talk a little bit about our background or his background. And then we're going to get into um not only his ADHD journey, we're also going to talk about imposter syndrome. That is a very hot topic today. And I thought it was something that I really wanted to discuss this week. So very excited to have him. So hey, Andy, how are you? Hey, Yakini. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited about this. Yeah, it's a, uh, I'm happy about the, the topic. And, uh, and I'm excited to get into this. Awesome. So can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself, your background, and then just talk a little bit about ADHD, your ADHD journey? Okay. Yeah, my name is Andy Gill. I'm a, I'm a 43-year-old man from Connecticut, and I have a wife and two kids that love me. And, um, <laughs> and so I, yeah, I spent about 20 years in the uh, construction and construction management uh, industry, and I made the switch to full-time coaching last year. Um, my, my journey with ADHD is, um, I've known that I've had ADHD basically my whole life. Um, but I wasn't, uh, diagnosed. I was a typical kid, rambunctious, you know, didn't do well in school, you know, really, really, uh, very, very typical, uh, combination type. But I was diagnosed when I was, um, 28 after I was married and had some kids. And when the, the, the things started stacking on me, like most people, you know, uh, it, it became a bit too much. And, um, and while I was being treated for, um, anxiety and depression. The psychiatrist asked me if I uh, knew about ADHD. And so we, uh, you know, got tested and, and went on uh, medications. And, and that was about 15 years ago. Oh, wow. So how did you feel once you had that diagnosis? Um, I already knew, like, so I already, like, I knew that I, I, I remember him saying, hey, you know, have you considered that, that you know, the, the possibility that you have ADHD? And I remember thinking, or I think I told him, like, I already know that I have ADHD, like I didn't, but I just didn't know that there was anything you could do about it, you know? Gotcha. So yeah, the, the, um, I guess the, the, the thought process around medication when I was a kid was that, you know, I think that, and, and we'll probably get into this a bit is like the, my parents didn't want to medicate me for them. They, uh, and so I think there's a lot of guilt that goes or, or associated with that. And, I, and I've experienced that as a parent also. Mm -hmm. So um, my mom, I remember her saying that, you know, we didn't want to drug you and make you a zombie. And so, you know, and so that's a, that's a topic for another, uh, another time. But, you know, th yeah, that's a, that, that was my, um, that was my diagnosis story. So did your parents, so you talked about the medication piece, but did your parents put any type of strategies in place to really help you? Or did you have strategies that that school put in place? No, no, that wasn't my experience. Uh, so I, I mean, I don't know. I don't think I've talked to my mom about that. It's probably something I should talk to her about. Um, you know, I know that there was a lot going on when I was a kid. So, um, and you know, I, I know that they, they probably did their best, but it was, it was a different time, you know, like we, we, we're talking about the eighties and, and early nineties. So, you know, we, we, we walked to school and, you know, whatever your, your troubles were, were your troubles. And so, yeah. um, and I know that, you know, I had a brother and sister and, and it was, a, there was a lot going on at home. So um, I don't think that it was, it really, I think that the school, the school system, I know my mom wanted me to do well and she wanted to help, but um, you know, the, um, the, the system wasn't set up in my favor. So I think that I just, and then I got to the point where I remember getting to the point where I just didn't care anymore. So, and I, I graduated in the bottom, actually there's a joke within my house. I've graduated in the bottom three people of my class. Like, so there was like, and <clears throat> so I call myself the, 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 the negative salutatorian. So I was a second to last. So I was also a salutatorian, but I was just on the other side of the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> The ADHD creativity. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So I yeah, I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't thrive in that environment. I couldn't, I didn't learn that way and I didn't see a purpose in it. And I remember once I had finished that and I went into nursing school, you know, in the army and, uh, and I was shocked that I, you know, that I did well because it was more of a, a physical tactile environment to learn in. So, you know, I, I, I believe that I wasn't able to learn or succeed things when I finished high school because of the environment I came from. Mm. Wow, that is powerful. So let me ask you, what made you want to leave construction and become a coach? And you're a life coach, so you mm. handle all aspects, right? You just don't handle people with ADHD. Yeah. But what made you want to do that? Yeah, so so I am, 
Um, I'm a recovering alcoholic and mm -hmm. I'm seven and a half years sober. Uh, right? And I think that like, I think that that was, a, that was like the part, the time in my life where I was like reborn. So that's when I let go of the, the I tried so hard, like, it, and it seems like that ADHD fight, that imposter syndrome, we're going to talk about a bit, you know, that, um, you know, hanging on to like, you know, hiding from who I was and, you know, and hiding the fight that it, that it took for me to try to have the appearance of, of being what I thought was successful at that time. So I think that, and once I, I stopped uh, drinking and, and I started to re-experience life and put a new, you know, and, and st start to string, string, sorry, string together some seasons and create some new memories, you know, I really started investing in my, you know, in learning about leadership because I, I ran a, a fairly large uh, a construction department um, locally here. And so I really started like shifting as I was, you know, fix, as I was working on fixing myself and healing myself, you know, I was seeing the, the struggles in others. And I really wanted to like servant leadership is really, really important to me. And I really want to, you know, when, when people, when, when you're a leader, you know, you don't, those people don't work for you. You know, you, you work for them and you get them the tools and resources that they need to be successful. And I, I got a great amount of, of uh, fulfillment from, from help helping others to, because I think that like I viewed it as, as I was helping others in, in their journey, like, so to help them in their career or, or, and I'm also a Boy Scout leader. So helping the boys and, you know, uh, developing the next level of, of leaders. Um, like it put me in an environment. I noticed that it put me in an environment for learning. It must be what like teachers, you know, experience, I would imagine. Like, so, like, so as you're in, in this environment, I'm also benefiting from being in that coaching environment to, and so it came to the point, you know, a couple of years ago where I, it was pretty clear to me. It was actually, I remember, it was a lesson I learned in, you know, I subscribed to a certain amount of woo-woo and, uh, you know, so the concept of surrender. So, you know, I was fighting a river for so long, you know, much like a salmon would go up river. And so I just, I learned, you know, that I didn't have to fight that anymore. And so I could, I could release construction from the equation. And so it, and that's when I really, uh, I really wanted to focus on the people, you know, and so that's how, and I think that there's a lot of people when, and you, when, when I told people, you know, Hey, listen, I'm going to quit my job in construction management and I'm going to be a life coach. You can imagine <laughs> that not, right? not everyone. Yeah. Not everyone was like, so, I mean, when I explain it to you, I hope that it, it makes a bit more sense, right. but you know, the looks that I got, I remember people were like, are you sure you want to do that? And yeah, uh, exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 That, yes. That's my story. And that's funny because, you know, then they start knocking on your door like, oh, are you still doing that life coach thing? <laughs> yeah, it even feels weird when I say it. You know, I was at, I still have a small um, uh, consultant business in construction. So I do, um, I, I test uh, homes for energy, you know, energy efficiency, and I do some consulting on building. And so when people like, you're a life coach? Yeah, that's a, yes, I am. Yep. Oh, no, but what, it, what I was saying is that it's even funnier if they start coming to see you. <laughs> Oh right. yeah, I do have some. Yeah, I do have some. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's too funny. So you yeah. also decided you wanted to do some service by putting a podcast out there. So you have a couple, you have your, your personal podcast, and then you also have the ADHD lifestyle magazine podcast. So tell us a little yeah. bit about. That. Yeah. So I wanted to, so I started, um, my wife and I uh, started a podcast uh, a year and a half, two years ago, 19, uh, 2019. Um, and it was called fun shit only like, and we were originally like, Hey, let's do a blog about our travel journeys. Like, we, cause we really exper uh, put a high level on experiences and not so much like physical things where we're a bit of, um, minimalist. So, and we were like, Oh, let's, and we became real. We did this podcast. We named it fun shit only because we had this calendar in our house, um, called fun shit only because it was the, it's the time of year that uh you know you put things on the calendar to look forward to and it became this podcast about the journey of living a fulfilled life mm -hmm. and so and that was and that was transformational for me but the current podcast that i'm working on is um oh i'm sorry is um adc lifestyle community so that was you know fun shit only was my was my how i got into podcasting and then when we when i got specifically into adhd and adhd and adhd coaching the content was no longer really relevant. So I was going to start a podcast about ADHD. And while we were, when we were in the, um, with the magazine, it made sense that we could uh, both achieve the same, um, the goal by um, creating a podcast called AC Lifestyle Community. 
Very nice. So before we switch over to imposter syndrome, can you give just any type of tips, whether a person, just kind of overall picture, just whether a person is trying to decide to get their self diagnosed or get their children diagnosed? I mean, what will your advice be to that? Because some, you know, you have that stigma piece, right? And I think we yeah. talked about this, is that you have the stigma of having some type of label, whether it's yourself or a child. So what would your mm. advice be to a person who's trying to make that decision? So I, I completely understand and I identify with, with what you're saying. Like, cause you know, I think that we have that natural resistance uh, of pulling back anytime our, you know, our kids are labeled with anything and also, you know, in ourselves and it's, you know, specifically, you know, our kids, cause you know, the, the, where they, where they're protectors. So, but I would say, you know, having, having gone through it and I have two children that have ADHD, um, is that there is nothing, there's no harm in, in getting an evaluation or, or getting the, the diagnosis, you know, it, there's only potential answers. So, and I think that, um, you know, I see a lot of people that are, that say that they're, they're undiagnosed ADHD, which is completely fine. You know, everyone is where they're, where they're at and, and we'll meet them there. And that's, that's absolutely fine. But my, my advice would be, that the, if your kids are in, in school, the 504s and the IEPs are through a diagnosis, you know, having, having those, those tools and they are tools accessible to you, you know, are, are through a diagnosis. And once you, once you do get that diagnosis, you know, then you, there's a lot, there's all these things that are available, you know, these, uh, these um, additional resources within the school system. But yeah, so I guess that I, I guess that would be my my spiel on on a on a diagnosis and, and uh, getting an evaluation. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, as you know, I get that question all the time, and I agree. I mean, with any label, yes, there are some stigma that comes with it, um, mm. but it has been such an advantage to my children having the diagnosis. And so, to your point. Uh, like my youngest is on the IEP and we are in a, you know, a specific school system that has a mm -hmm. wonderful IEP program mm. and then camps. So they attend a camp that if he was not diagnosed, he would not be really? able to. And so this camp is an absolutely wonderful camp. It supports those who have ADHD, Asperger's, you know, all these different types of labels, mm. but they are kids that get to just be themselves when they're at this mm. camp. So there is, there's just a lot of resources out there. People just don't realize how much resources are mm. out there to support those who have ADHD and some other diagnosis. So yeah, mm. I agree with that. I think I'll add to like, so I think that there's, I mean, there's, and I get it, you know, my, I, you know, the, the stigma around labels, right. Mm -hmm. But I just would like to add, like, there's, there's nothing whatever your children are or whatever you are, it's not wrong. You're perfectly created the way that you're supposed to be. And it's, and, and being, having an evaluation, you know, might, it, it only will gain resource, you know, gain resources from there. And I think like, and to the, to, to the point, like your reaction to that. And so, and our kids don't know, they, they don't know the difference. They only know what we're, we expose them to. Right. So, and I was on this, uh, I, I was interviewed on a YouTube channel last week and, and, um, and the gentleman, Adam Duval, um, he's on the other side of the pond, said that his son had received um, an ADHD diagnosis and he viewed it as a superpower immediately because, and I, and I said, that's a testimony to the way that you presented that information to him. And it really is. And so today, I, actually just today, I heard my daughter, you know, I, I, I was out working and I came back and she got home from school and she was telling me how someone, a young man, she's a senior in high school, she's going to be going off to college and, and her her diagnosis is helping her in, in transitioning over to her college experience. But a young man asked her like, Hey, can I ask you some questions about ADHD? I know that you, you know, she's open about it. And so, and she, and she's a high performer and she's, you know, and she was able to help him through that, you know, a little bit. So the way that we present the information and the way that we, you know, the way that we, the way, if we take it on is a bad thing, like, Oh no, no, this is, you know, this, then that's what the, the energy that they're going to pick up. And then they're not, and it's not, and it's not misportraying it. Your children are perfect. They're exactly the way they're supposed to be. I love that. I love that. Mm. All right. So let's switch topics. So all right, get into <laughs> imposter syndrome. So first of all, can you just give a basic definition of what is imposter syndrome? So imposter syndrome is it's, you know, that what an imposter is, is when you, 
Imposter syndrome is when you believe that others, I'm messing this up in my head. Imposter syndrome is when you believe that others think you are something else. Mm-hmm. It's when you're, and it's, it's, uh, it's caused by a, a slew of different things, but um, it's, it's when you think that the merits that you've earned have nothing to do with you that they're, associated, they're attributed to luck or being in the right place at the right time. You know, so you think that you've you know, risen to a level. It's a it's common problem in, in a, people that are achieving things, high achievers or achievements or advancements. So if you just got promoted or if you, just, if you are newly a parent or if you are stepping into a new leadership role, you know, a, a, if you may believe that you didn't earn your way there or that you don't have the credentials or ability to do that, you know, like it's when you're, if you kind of imagine like, um, uh, you know, being from like, if you woke up tomorrow and you're the CEO of a fortune 500 company, you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. You know, like that's, that's kind of what it's like. I remember the, remember the movie big where the, yeah. the parents switched. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I, that's what I, you know, if I woke up and as my dad child tomorrow and went to his job, I, that's how, what I would imagine like imposter mm-hmm. syndrome on, on, uh, on, uh, times a thousand. Yeah. No, I like that. That that actually is a good analogy for those who know it. Um, so those who are much younger than us, <laughs> you can look that up. <laughs> yeah, it's too funny. So yeah. so tell us. So you're saying that it could be caused by you know many things. So what are some of those reasons why people mm. have this imposter syndrome? Mm. I think that it's so we all have a gremlin. We all have a gremlin in us, and it's called like it's a statement of uh, I'm not good enough. And so you know. Uh, or like, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not, uh, you know, it's, everyone has this, uh, this uh, gremlin message that's, that's inside them. So if you think that, you know, you're not good enough, you know, and so you have this message, I'm not good enough. And then you have the other component to that would be, and I'm going to be found out. Mm-hmm. So it's this two different levels. So, so you're trying to hide who you are. So, or you're trying to hide who you believe you are yeah. and that, you know, that gremlin message comes from the, your, your belief systems, from the experiences that you've experienced. It comes from, and it, and this is really important. It's from your per- perception of what people think you are, not necessarily, you know, actual or perceived. So it doesn't necessarily even have to be in a lot of times, like that's a lot of the way out is through understanding that it is just a perception and it's not necessarily you know, what others, what others think. Okay. And do you think ADHDers tend to internalize it more than your neurotypicals? I mean, because I know the reality is, I mean, even pretty much anyone can experience this, but mm. we tend to internalize it so much more. I mean, what, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah. I mean, I think that ADHDers do have a, have a high percentage of being, of, of having experience. So it, an imposter syndrome is an experience. Um, so I think that ADHDers have a high, uh, high risk of, of experiencing imposter syndrome. And, and just because of like what the traits are that are associated with, with, uh, with, with ADHD. So, you know, w- with impulsivity, with, uh, you know, uh, short-term memory, with, with um, all these, you know, hyperactivity, with all these things, the way that, that uh, neurotypicals react to us or the way that we perceive neurotypicals react to us, you know, we will generate this, um, perfectionism right so in order to hide you know the the traits about ourselves that we think are like in, inappropriate or out of out of out of place or w- whatever it is you know so in the in the process of hiding who we are that will create imposter syndrome as we rise you know rise up through the ranks or or are experiencing new experiences okay okay that makes sense so is there any way to work through some of this? Like what are some tips to help people work through imposter syndrome? Hmm. So I think that it's, it's important to, to fact check yourself, right? So imposter syndrome and shame, like uh, go, go hand in hand. So, hmm. you know, so if you're hiding yourself, you know, you're hiding yourself because you think that it's like an I am statement, like l- lucky if you're a Kini, I just finished up writing a, a 1500 word article on on shame so everything i see i'm seeing today is through the lens of shame so you know <laughs> <That's too funny. laughs> so yeah so i think that like if you're hiding yourself you know you're doing that because of shame and shame happens is the result of like uh, an i am statement i am bad versus 
this is bad, you know, so when you internalize that as I am. So if you're hiding something about yourself because you think that you're not enough, you know, that's shame. And shame, and the way that we root out shame is to expose it, right? So if we're gonna, if we're gonna say, if you're experiencing imposter syndrome, like talk about it, like, and, and find, like, we need to air that out. And that's, that's how we, that's how, that's how we kill it, you know? So find someone that's, that deserves to hear it or, you know, that is worthy of like, I'm not saying like go on Facebook and post, you know, unless you're comfortable with that, you know, but you don't, you don't have to tell everybody, but you need to tell the people that, that deserve to hear it. Like, so it it has to do with your relationship with vulnerability. So find someone that is deserving of hearing it and have that conversation. Fact check yourself. You know, like, I think that a lot of imposter syndrome is in, is an incorrect assessment of competence. So like, if you think that, that, oh my God, all right, well, this, in this, I just got promoted to this management level. And that manager that I look up that I, the, my, my mental image, when I close my eyes and see what that mental image is, it's perfection. It's this, 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 this. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not, you know, every, like having a, a relationship with failure is really very helpful. You know, that's something I learned, like, so be allowing yourself to fail, you know, and learn from those experiences, if, if, like, changing your relationship with failure so that it's it's a learning experience you know you have to th- th- that's how we we got here like i used to be like decimated by failures you know i i had this bad business experience back in 2008 to 2012 and i just never thought that i would go into business again and i've grown so much from it you know this is a, and i had so much shame around it and like in and when i was when i reached that next level the imposter syndrome was horrible and just working through it is uh, has been a project so wow. I hope I answered your question. No, that's very good. So for, so we, so really, I, I guess that would be an umbrella of people, but let's talk about parents helping their children through imposter syndrome. Are a lot of the techniques that you talk about, is that some of the things that you would do with their children or your children, for example, or yeah. are there different things that you would put in place for them? So I think that like, if when I think about this, I, I don't work with kids, but I have kids. And uh, I guess, you know what, that's not so true. I work with the scouts. I work with, uh, you know, I, I work with my own kids and, and they have the, all their friends come here. So it's, uh, uh, I think that it, a lot of it is the same, but so when I th- think about uh, coaching a kid through this, and that's the way that, that's the lens that I look through it as through a coach, you know, I think about the way that I, I talk to my kids and what, how I catch myself, right? So if you have to see your kid having a shame experience or, you know, imp- experiencing imposter syndrome, like, so if they're in, in little league and so, you know, they're up to bat and they don't think that they can do it. Right. So that, that would be imposter syndrome. Right. So for a kid or, you know, some so, sort of sporting event yeah. and you're like, you're like, but you can do it, you know, like just get up there and do it. You know, that's, that's the way we do that as parents. Right. And that's the, and, and that might not get the results that you're looking for. Right. Just by telling them that they can. So, you know, when we coach people, we, we ask empowering questions, right? So if the, if your kid believes X, Y, Z, you know, so you need to ask empowering open-ended questions. That's with who, what, when, how, you know, hey, how did you handle this? La- you know, do, hey, do you remember this other thing? How did that work out? Do you remember this other? Tell me about an experience where, where this felt the same, but like it felt the same in your body, this scared, but you were, it worked out for you and, and you came through the other side and you'd be like, oh yeah, that time, that blah, 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 whatever. And then, so now he can grab onto that and say, all right, well, that, that's, you know, that if that happened, you know, if that's true, isn't it possible that this, that you're, you're feeling over here, isn't it possible that that might be a story that your, your brain's telling yourself? Like you don't have to believe all the stories that your brain tells yourself, right? So uh, coaching techniques of like acknowledging, validating where your kids are at, meeting them where they are and excavating within their brain so mm-hmm. that they come to the conclusion on their own, you know, that they, that to build their confidence. Cause a lot of times the stuff that we need to be successful already resides in our brain as adults and children. So really, you're, you're helping them remember a successful memory, and you're having them feel it, too, at the same time. That's right. Yep. Yep. Pull it out. Dig it out. Yep. That is awesome. So is there anything that we haven't discussed, um, any type of last-minute thoughts around imposter syndrome that you can share with the audience? Um, uh, let me just, I just think that the, it's the, it's, I think that 
I just want to like recap the, the shame component of it, just because that's what I'm thinking about, you know, as I told you, Kenny, <laughs> is like, I think that anytime I'm just so deep into it right now, it's a shame and vote. So changing your, like, so looking at vulnerability as a tool, you know, so if you're experiencing shame, you know, or if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're hiding a component of yourself, because you believe that if you're found out that, that you're going to feel this certain way, you know, and that you and you have this perfectionism. So you're going to work three times harder so that no one sees any mistakes of yours. That's shame around that. And mm -hmm. in order to, to root that out, it's done through, you know, exposing it in vulnerability. Vulnerability is the tool is a way out by saying, Hey, I'm, I'm struggling with this or, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm having a hard time with this. And this is what, these are the challenges I had. Would you, can I enlist you on my team to help me, you know, like empowering others, you know, that I think that just re, you know, looking at vulnerability as a tool to silence shame uh, and, and uh, speaking the feelings that you're having. I think that that is the way to, I just really, I really believe that that's the way through, you know, imposter syndrome. Nice. Very nice. And is there any tools out there, whether it be books or YouTube channels or podcasts that people can mm. go and listen to, whether it be on ADHD or imposter syndrome? Mm. Um, well, um, I watched the TED. I don't, I don't have any specific, like I have a book that's in my, my basket for imposter syndrome that I want to read. It's called, uh, why do I feel like an imposter from mm -hmm. Sandy Min. I've listened to just the clip of it and I'm interested in, and, uh, and it has a lot of, of great ratings. There's a TEDx talk from uh, Lou Salomon that you can find on YouTube, which is really quite excellent and, uh, and was, was very helpful in, in, uh, in me, you know, connecting the dots and how I viewed it. Okay, perfect. And if people have any more questions for you, how can they reach you? Um, you can come find me on LinkedIn or on uh on uh, what's it? It's called Instagram. That's the one. <laughs> that Instagram. <laughs> yes, at at Coach Andy Gill, and my last name is spelled with one L. And uh, on LinkedIn, it's Andrew Gill, uh, G I L. Very but cool. I have a blog, AndrewGill.com. That's right. Yeah, I have a blog. Yeah, there, there you go. Right, and it's a good mm -hmm. blog too. So very mm -hmm. cool, very cool. So thank you, Andy. Thank you for coming on my show. As always, I'm excited to talk with you. We have great conversations. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. All right, everyone. So that concludes another episode of ADHD Love Parent Talk. If you want more information like this, do not forget to hit the subscribe button and hit that notification bell because every time an episode comes out, it will notify you. And if you like this content, don't forget to hit the like button. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, Andy. Bye.